All right, coming at you all the way live from the lower bottoms of West Oakland. This is Revolution. I'm very excited right now. People listening, if you've been watching the live streams that I do on Tuesday, if you listen to the show, not so much nowadays, I have a two-year-old son. I have quite a few children, maybe too many. Uh, Can't take them back now. But I do have a two-year-old son, and with my two-year-old son now in my in my later years, I actually sit and watch cartoons with him, and I try to watch cartoons that I watched as like a young six to eleven-year-old with him, and some of those cartoons just aren't as colorful as these new computer animated ones. And he doesn't get it. He doesn't like it. Just doesn't care. We try to watch old Disney movies. Sometimes he likes them. Sometimes he doesn't care. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly trying to find new stuff for him to like. He's a big fan of Into the Spider Verse, which I like, and he loves that. Um, but there was a show that I saw randomly on Netflix called Chico Bonbon, bon, Monkey with the Tool Belt. And he's got this monkey that he plays with in the tub. A little squeezable monkey thing. So he says, monkey! So I was like, all right, we're going to watch the monkey show. He fell in love with this show instantly. He's never fallen in love with a show like this. I mean, he's definitely fallen in love with this show. And I'm watching this show with him constantly. And at a certain point, I'm watching this show and I'm thinking to myself, I feel like the people that make this show are like leftists because the whole purpose of the show, there's this monkey and he's got these friends and they just fix problems. That's it. There's no fighting. It's not a violent show. It's actually a really fun show. They tend to incorporate music really well in the show. Uh, And he never asks for money. There's never an exchange of, of, of money whenever he fixes a problem. He's got like a bat phone. And people are like, hey, the toilet's clogged. It's never like a toilet clogged. But it's always like a problem. He comes and he fixes it with his friends. And that's it. And I'm like, this is beautiful. And then the show that blew my mind, that made me go, I have to contact these people, was the show about automate. They literally had a show about automation, which I think is kind of hilarious. And... If anyone remembers during the whole the whole uh, primary, it was 2018, everybody come on the scene, last year, 2019, Andrew Yang kind of campaigned on this thing of automation is, is going to take your job. And so the robots are coming to take your job. And they have an episode about automation, and their episode of automation is kind of like that old like Marxist look at automation. Like, hey, this is going to make your life easier. We're going to automate these things and we're going to make your life easier. No one lost their job due to automation, which I thought was interesting. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to contact these people and see what happens. And lo and behold, I was blessed enough to get a response email from the creator of Chico Bonbon, my kid's favorite show, and the creator of so many more shows. Uh, he's the Emmy Award winning creator of Wow Wow Wubsy. He did a show on Disney, a Ying Yang Yo, Sesame Street contributor. He was a producer on Fairly Odd Parents. He writes children's books. And of course, he makes maybe his greatest show, Chico Bon Bon, Monkey with a Tool Belt. Mr., or please welcome to the show, Mr. Bob Boyle. <laughs> Whoa, full on sound effects studio right here. Amazing. <laughs> that that's like all I got. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Jason. It's it's, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Oh, thank thank you for taking the time to uh to talk to me. Yeah. So, I have to ask and I and I there's not a lot a video on you. I went. I went trying to find some 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 video on you. 
Uh, do you like kind of being the low key animator guy behind all these shows? Yeah, yeah. I think actually, I think most animation people are sort of introverts. <laughs> um, I'm more of an outrovert than most, I think, in the industry. But um, yeah, I think we're you know we kind of grew up uh, as those kids who would stay inside and draw all day and, and make their own friends on paper. <laughs> you know, um, I don't quite fit into that mold. I was you know I was a little bit more of a. I, I actually. I grew up wanting to be an athlete. So, um, you know, I was like full-time sports around the clock, you know, uh, every season was baseball, basketball, football, you know, whatever. I was going to make it to the NBA, all of that. So uh, that's an anomaly for, for animation folks. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I think most, most people in the animation industry are, are pretty egoless, you know, <laughs> like, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're sort of the, the ugly stepchild of the, uh, uh, entertainment industry you know no, no really one. yeah yeah I, you know recently recently we've gotten a little bit more cred and we're we're really the the only part of the industry that's kind of keeping going through this pandemic which is i was i was gonna say i have a good friend of mine who actually was on the show for a past episode uh because he was in a band mm -hmm. um we grew up together and he actually works at pixar he's an animator over at uh at pixar he's been there since toy story 2 um and uh, they, he mentioned a little bit about, you know, the pandemic and I, it didn't hit me. I was like, oh, I guess you guys are the only people that can create new content without <laughs> having to worry about uh, going into contaminated areas. You can kind of create probably in a, in a home studio. Yeah. So. yeah. I mean, because, you know, we, uh, when we go into the studios uh, and not home. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, non-pandemic days you know it was just um go into the studio and you just sit in your office and you draw <laughs> and then you pass <laughs> it off to somebody else so you might as well be at home you know i mean there's of course there's you know the the times where you get in a room and you can bounce ideas off each other and that's you know that's really missing these days um but uh, but yeah we can we can pretty much function on zoom so that's that's so interesting. Uh, but I do I do want I do want to ask you a little bit about uh, young young Bob Boyle mm -hmm. because on your website it says that you wanted to be a professional football player. So I have to ask, being being a huge sports fan, mm. what was your team growing up? Well, I grew up in um, I was born in New Jersey, but grew up my formative football years were in uh, San Antonio, Texas. So okay, uh, so <laughs> and. I, uh, my first memories are of Roger Staubach and the Cowboys. Uh, so like that I'm a hardcore way back old school, Tom Landry, Roger Staubach, uh, Dallas Cowboy fan. So, uh, yeah, that's a live, live and die by that team to this day. And I was, I certainly wanted to be playing for the Cowboys. <laughs> Did you want to be a quarterback? Were you going to be Roger the Dodger? No, no. I thought maybe like wide receiver. You know, I was always kind of like pretty quick. I thought, oh, you okay, know, wide receiver, cornerback. You know, that that's kind of my speed. What's his name? Is it Mel Renfro? Was he the wide receiver for the Cowboys? Mel Renfro was a cornerback. Yeah, okay. cornerback. Wow, no, nice one. Thinking of <laughs> who? Oh God, they did have they. Oh, what was his name? There was a. Uh, I can't think. In what position? All I know is Drew, I'll give it to you. Drew Pearson. I know Drew Pearson. Yeah, Drew Pearson. And who played on the other side of Drew Pearson? Uh, Tony Hill was over there. Let's see. Um, there's the Golden Richards, Butch Johnson. Maybe that's who I'm uh, thinking. I'm Drew thinking of Golden Richards. Bob Hayes before that. Bob Bullet Bob Hayes. Bullet Bob Hayes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so your Cowboys, medal. your Cowboys can still win the division because the division is looking so horrible right now. It's pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's pathetic. Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, last last team standing. I think with between COVID and all the injuries oh. and everything, I think it's that's where it's headed. But it's COVID it's is though. it's hurting my. You know, I I have a. a love-hate relationship with the nfl that probably any conscious person does right because yeah. you, between their horrible racial issues and then the brain injury issues and they're kind of horrible with their union issues um i still watch it and 
this COVID thing is just kind of breaking my heart because as I watch games get canceled constantly, there was a story that came out that didn't get much traction and, and it, it made me sad to get traction about it. A player for the Jaguars that was a fifth round pick. He had got COVID. He got sick and it gave him respiratory problems that are causing him to miss the whole season. Ugh. And this was supposed to be his season to like your contract year, right? Yeah. You show out this year, you can get the, the, the contract. And like those stories are not going to get told or even amplified in the year of COVID. And college football is even worse. Yeah. Um, with games getting canceled. So that I, I don't know if it, if, if it hits you the same way sometimes when you see those cancellations, like, oh, I hope everybody's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, like their, their careers are so slim, you know, they've got a small window. So like losing a year, you know, or an opportunity, like I said, that's, it's huge. Oh yeah. It, it, that, that yeah, breaks my heart. But yeah. And then Dak, I watched that game where he broke his, uh, his leg, oh, his ankle. Horrible. Horrible. Like, yeah. you know, I, he seems like such a, a, a good dude. It's hard to not pull for him, you know, like whether you're a cowboy fan or not, like he seems like he's a, he's a solid guy. Feel for him. Yeah. And and this was supposed to be his big contract here. So that hurts even more. You're like, Oh man, <laughs> that wasn't fair. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he'll be fine, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but like I, you know, like it was growing up and yeah, I was all about the sports and, uh, football was was my thing and but you know if you have seen pictures of me i'm i'm still at like five seven one twenty five i I think i was that at age 12 you know so i realized you knew you were like i'm gonna hit the growth spur be six four i held out on that hope for a long time and then then i was like no that's this is not gonna happen and uh i thought basketball i still got a chance at basketball because there's short quick guys and I, you know, mm-hmm. I'm like a hustler and, uh, I was like, I, I, I could do that. And then, you know, I, I reality hit on that. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I was, I was practicing basketball. I was outside. It was like one summer and it was summer before high school year. And, uh, these guys in the neighborhood came running by, they were jogging by and they were a year older than me and they'd been in high school cross country and uh, mm-hmm. they're like basketball is not a real sport, man. You got to join cross country. I'm like cross country, like what? Uh, you know, come on out, you know. So like they they had me come out and run with them the next day, and I went and, and I was able to hang with them for you know three miles, and mm-hmm. um, and that sort of changed my life right there. I was really? like, oh, I was like running, run. I you know I can run. There's no physical limitations to running. You can be small. It's all about effort, you know, and I got plenty of effort and plenty of heart and desire. And so I'm, I was like, yeah, this is it. I don't have to worry about other teammates, you know, like, you're, I mean, well, you, I mean, you, know, you, you work as a team, but like it's running, it's very individual, you know, you're in control of your own, you don't have to wait for the quarterback to throw you the ball or, you know, anything yeah. like that. So, so yeah, I became a huge runner. I thought that was my path to glory. <laughs> Uh, and, and you st- and but you're still drawing this whole time, right? Yeah, I was always the kid who drew in school. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I, I drew for the school newspaper. I was that kid, you know. I drew for the school newspaper, um, and my mom was super supportive of. Uh, you know, she was a big cartoon fan. Like she, she would buy me all these little Charlie Brown, you know, the Peanuts books, you know, the mm-hmm, old ones, mm-hmm. if you remember. Um, just anything we could go to yard sales and, and she gobble up all these things or from the thrift store or something. She'd just get me any kind of cartoon book was super supportive and, um, did a lot of political cartoons in, in, um, and loved political cartoons. I was, you know, before animation, that was something I was thinking about getting into. Did Is it, your animation a bit of a political cartoon sometimes in its own way? Um, you know, I don't think, I mean, I think not political i think we you know we make sort of social commentary a lot of times but uh but yeah it's pretty light it's pretty light you know there's there'll be some inside jokes with the on the older shows like powerpuff and things like that but um no it's pretty apolitical in general so my daughter was a huge powerpuff fan Uh 
And I believe she still has her Powerpuff blanket, a pink blanket with all the the characters on it. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I didn't really watch it. You know, she'd be in her room with her TV and watching her show and and don't bother her while that was on was definitely like the the mode of of that young girl at that time and when i told her that i i believed you were involved with powerpuff her eyes got as big as oreo cookies <laughs> yeah yeah no I, so yeah. how how did that whole thing come about um so yeah that was um that was a f- few years back uh i didn't i did not i want to just make it clear i did not create powerpuff girls that was uh, a genius called craig mccracken who created that back in the 90s the original powerpuff uh and mm-hmm. that had a really great run it was super influential influenced me love that show and I, I did work on that original show but uh, a few years back, they wanted to reboot it. And uh, <clears throat> like they're doing rebooting all of these shows these days. Uh, yeah. Um, which we could talk about. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I jumped at the chance to be able to do that and give it sort of a new spin and, uh, and, and ruin people's childhood. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Okay, well, I haven't seen. So I'm I'm younger than you, so the cartoons we watched were definitely going to be different. And there was a cartoon that I watched as a young person called Voltron. Uh huh. And as a nine year old kid, that was the end all be all. That was like it wouldn't. It wasn't the first Japanese animation that I saw, but it just blew me away. And. I wanted everything Voltron. There's another one called Robotech. And I just, that's all I wanted. I was actually part of my grandmother. Let me be part of the Robotech fan club. Like I was all about that stuff. Now I went back to watch Voltron, the original ones with my son and he just doesn't care. I went back and watched him. I was like, these aren't really that good. (laughs) Like in my mind, I made it way better than it was. So it got rebooted in like 2010 and that was okay. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and then it got rebooted again by Netflix either last year or two years ago. And that's amazing. My son will watch it. It's colorful. It's the, the storytelling is way better. And I'm like, I don't remember this even being part of the original show. <laughs> and and my 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 friend Dan Larson did a whole episode on the reboot of, of Voltron. And he said the creators of that wanted to create a show that was what they thought Voltron was in their minds. <laughs> not what it actually, not what it actually was. Like just make it that much better. Yeah. So I'm not against rebooting things that probably could use a good reboot. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, we got a lot of, um, you know, a lot of love, but also a lot of hate, you know, anything you touch, anything that's beloved, to people they're gonna Jeez, have opinions as george lucas yeah <laughs> yeah and you know they're like this isn't the show that i grew up with <laughs> and i thought well you know what you're 35 years old we're, we're not making this for you <laughs> thank you <laughs> and, um, and it's a different time and you know like um craig mccracken who was the um the original creator i you know i i, I felt really it was really difficult to like touch his baby, you know, like he mm-hmm. created this thing. It was precious to him and to have somebody else run with it and take it in a different direction. Um, you know, I reached out to him and, and just said, Hey man, I, you know, we're, we're following our gut here. We're doing what we believe is right. We are trying to honor the show and, but we're doing some things differently. And, and he was really kind. And he said, um, you know, he sort of gave his blessings. Like, yeah, it's, it's a different time. It's, I would do the show differently now, <laughs> you know, like, cause you know, people change, technology changes, the world changes. You have to adapt with that. So, um, yeah. Is that show, when is it, it came out in 96 was the first one? Uh, 98? Um, 90s. Yeah. Right around then. Yeah. I'm not sure the exact dates, but yeah. So you can't, I mean, that was just such a different time. Yeah. Think about how kind of happy people were in general. <laughs> in 1998. Yeah, yeah. Just a very, very different time. 
So to go back and say, well, you got to recreate 1998, like, well, dude, it can't look the same. Like that look is very dated. Yeah. 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 Well, e even just like the role of, of, uh, I mean, that was like the first like girl power yeah. cartoon, yeah. you know, um, it was hugely impactful in, in that way. So, you know, to just have to deal with that, and you know it was happening like we we're putting together a show at the same time as sort of the me too movement and you know um and it was Man, that's yeah really different it was it very was different and, and, you know the animation industry itself was back then when it uh the original show it was very male centric and it has been for you know for a long time it's just been dudes it's a very dude centric um industry and up until up until recently, and we were we were really like proud with our show that we actually staffed, you know, over I don't know I think it was like maybe seventy percent were female, you know, which was, you know, the, times are changing, you know. I think kids were growing, kids have been growing up with anime, um, you know, with Voltron, and then you know that opened the door for other anime shows, and and females have been really into that and it's really opened the door in in the animation industry for them so um it was it was cool to have a really diverse crew and and you know we're making a show about three little girls like it's <laughs> if you're if you don't have you know women writers and women storyboard artists and people telling the stories that are female then you know <laughs> uh, you gotta look at yourself <laughs> So you you also did a show that my older son, who's seventeen, grew up loving, which was, uh, and my my daughter also knew was Wow Wow Wubsy. Yeah, yeah. And you won an Emmy for that. I did. Yeah, yeah. It's very very lucky. That was that was my that was my baby. <laughs> uh, it's, okay. It's very much at the heart of who I am. You know, it's uh, yeah. It's a pre, it's a show for preschoolers, but um, yeah, it's it's. Wubsy is is uh, at the core of my soul, I think. <laughs> so, of all the characters that you've created, is is Wubsy the best kind of? Uh, that's like Little Bob. I think so. Yeah, I think uh, that's yeah. I think that's where I live. <laughs> <laughs> I think the town of Wuzzleburg is where I'd like to live. You know, this is sort of my idyllic <laughs> place. Um, and yeah, I think in uh, that sort of transferred into Chico Bonbon. It's got the same sort of positive vibe, energy. Um, you know, it's a little more fast paced um, and actiony, but um, yeah, I think those two shows for sure. Those two characters, I, I love. So I'm, I'm generally like a pretty positive guy. So um, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I was thinking that because when I watch when I watch Chico, and I did, I I stayed up. Uh, late last night watching uh, Powerpuff uh, Girls because I hadn't, I just didn't remember it. I, I remember the look of it, but I didn't remember it. Um, and then I woke up this morning to uh, a Chico Bonbon request. And so <laughs> here I am. I, I'm sorry uh, for your, what you have. Don't. <laughs> man, hey, man. At this point, like when I was, you know, it's funny as a younger dad, I was kind of a jerk. And I was like, nope, I don't want to watch it. We're going to watch what I want to watch. Now, as an old, I don't care. Yeah. He's happy. I got so many books to read to do this show and so much like research to do to do this show. I don't have time to sit around here and critique what a two-year-old is trying to watch, and especially <laughs> if the show is positive. I haven't seen any anything negative in that show. And I was trying to find negativity in that show because the name, I was like, what kind of... <laughs> what is this gonna be like i really thought it was gonna be some like real over the top stereotypical latin thing for some reason the name yeah mm -hmm. and then as we watched it i was like oh man this is really effing me up because it's not anything that i thought it was whatever i thought it was gonna be isn't that yeah um and i think the automation episode is the pizza rito episode right yeah yeah mm -hmm. And I'm watching this thing and I'm going, I, I feel like this guy must, must live in San Francisco or maybe L.A. Because who the hell would think of combining a pizza and a burrito unless you lived in one of those cities and you had a sushi rito, which is like a bunch of rice. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we, we try and reflect, uh, reflect back society, you know, and, and preschool friendly ways for sure. For sure. Oh, you, you do a phenomenal job. Uh, I, I think and, and when I, when I, when I hit you up about the audit, was that, so when you, first of all, automation and preschoolers, you know, you opened me up to getting to be able to have like a very interesting conversation with this two-year-old. That's poor kid is when he finally goes back to school and the world opens back up, he is going to have a lot of leftist critiques for his friends and teachers. And I'm going <laughs> to blame you for it. So <laughs> when you guys were, cause you're still coming up with the, with the shows uh, topics, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, we just wrote a bunch of episodes for season two. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you were coming up with the automation one, what was kind of the the the, the thought process behind that? Because I thought that was so interesting that automation didn't destroy people's jobs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think you know the the curriculum of the show is uh, based around engineering concepts. Mm -hmm. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So you know, like if yeah, if you. It's not real heavy handed, you know, which we try not to be, um, but it's, it's baked into the show is some sort of, uh, some sort of concept that's related to engineering. I mean, some of those concepts are like, you know, elasticity or, um, yeah. you know, like, which is, which we do through, uh, a show about underwear. underwear. <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, so we try to make it like kind of kid friendly in that way. Um, or, you know, adhesion, uh, which is all, all, but like bubblegum is sort of the kid entry point to that. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think, you know, basically when we're putting the show together, we're in a room and we we write down a, a list of things on the wall that are, you know, engineering concepts. And, and then we'll just sort of brainstorm off of like, okay, like what could automation be? Like what's a story that we could make around automation? You know, is it about robots? Is it about uh, assembly lines? You know, what, what could the, the ridiculous problem be? You know? <laughs> um, and I, I like it because, you know, the name of the town is Blunderbird. And, yeah. and just the idea that everybody in there is just a blundering kind of... <laughs> A blundering idiot in, in a lot of ways, you know, they don't, mm -hmm. they don't see things quite clearly. And then Chico's got to come in and, and fix things in his creative way. Um, yeah. My so, son she, does love the blunder. Is it, is it coleslaw? Is it Miss Coleslaw? Mrs. Coleslaw, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Every time she comes on the screen, he yells out, Coleslaw! <laughs> yeah. I think, you know. Chico! <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, like the show is for, for preschoolers, obviously, but... Um, you know, when I was doing Wow Wow Wubsy, I, you know, I'd never done preschool before. I'd done Fairly Odd Parents and, you know, it's just like a little bit older comedies for, for kids. And so I did some research and I was like, started watching preschool shows and, and I just couldn't take, I wanted to like. <laughs> I Rip just, your hair out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was just horrible. I, you know, like I, it's just very pandering, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. the shows and, um, I just, I was like, I can't do that. So like, I just wanted to make a, sh uh, a show where kids would, first of all, they'd just be entertained, like make them laugh. And then if they learn something along the way, that's great. You know, cause you, you gotta get engaged the kids for them to learn anything. So just make it fun and then have sort of a, a lesson baked into it that they're going to walk away and they're not even going to realize that they've just learned about, um, uh, automation. They're just going to go, you know, that was a fun story about pizzeritos and, it, you know, later in life they will go, Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, I, I didn't tell you this on the email. I, I didn't even, I forgot about it for some reason. I actually worked on a kid's, uh, I worked on the live tour of a kid's TV show. Oh, wow. Uh, Yo Gabba Gabba. Oh yeah. That show was amazing. So when you said that you watched, preschool tell that was kind of the same impetus for for those guys for for christian and scott you know, yeah watching absolutely that was happening at the same time that i was doing wubsy so it didn't you know it didn't exist as me uh, for me to reference you know and, mm -hmm. and, and but that that took it to a whole nother level and that was, mm -hmm. that was phenomenally creative it was, it was great i think you know, like the other thing for me is like when i'm making the show i like i want 
I wanted people like you to be able to watch the show with your your child and not want to kill yourself. Like, I mean, <laughs> you know, like it it wouldn't be the thing that you choose to watch, but you're going to watch it. You're going to have to watch it mm-hmm. with your kid, you know. So, like, make you get a chuckle out of it. Make you, you know, at least mildly entertained and not annoyed by it. So. Well, I, again, when I'm sitting there finding these uh, these these leftist secret messages in here, where I'm like, well, you know, this guy has like a bat phone and a very elaborate house, and uh, to to kind of give people some some context on why I came to this conclusion, like I didn't just watch it one day and make it up in my head. <laughs> There's an episode where it's really hot. And the mayor of Blunderberg gives everybody popsicles. And I was like, what mayor (laughs) would think to give everyone popsicles? A socialist mayor. (laughs) And and how did that idea get through the city council? (laughs) (laughs) This is like. The Chavez is Venezuela <laughs> over here. Does everybody what do you what do you need, Chico, to start your your business? You know, Chico's getting uh uh loans to start his his co-op with his friends. It's, it's a it's a beautiful town, Blunderberg. No one pays no, no they get injured. Free health care. Well, hey, you know, shouldn't that be the way it is? I mean the the birthing episode. <laughs> It didn't end with them getting a big bill for for them driving that egg all the way through town right. <laughs> to the hospital. I'm sitting here drawing. I'm like, I got to contact this man because if he doesn't know this, now they're going to change everything. The next time you watch the show, the new season, wow. <laughs> Chico Bump on is hitting everybody <laughs> with a bill. That's the new problem. How to pay off the bill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's and there's and and even the way you guys treat competition which i think is like really important um because as you know we exist in a in a in a world where people just need to have surplus right that's kind of the the basis of this this capitalist system and it's funny i was having one of those thanksgiving talks right you, we all have them every year you, you you shouldn't talk about certain things with family and friends. People say, and I'm like, why? I don't have a problem. And someone had said something along the lines of, it's kind of inherent in human nature for people to always want more. And I was like, uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, if you look at societies where they kind of had things in abundance, that's why they didn't have to go out and plunder because they, had everything there so they created things like art and music and you know if you want to really look back on that so in this world of blunderberg where everybody kind of has everything you don't really have these these real deal conflicts the issues are um there's a monster that just wants to give everybody high fives (laughs) and sticking to everyone and that and that was the first one I saw, and I was like, I really got to see how this turns out. And that's what that's what got me watching. I was like, what is? How are they going to fix this monster situation? <laughs> Which ha- you have to explain the thought process behind the high fiving, sticky handed monster. There, so there's an octopus, and there's people stuck to this octopus, and the main character has a tool belt with everything in the tool belt that solves all these problems. And uh, he gets a phone. You know, he finds out his tool belt stuck to this octopus. And what what was what is what did they what was the name of that episode? Uh, let's see. That was the goo monster. I know silicone was like the thing that saved the yeah, day. Yeah, silicone and and uh, lubrication was the sort of concept. Um, which you know, yeah, there got some chuckles in the room when we said lubrication is the concept <laughs> for a preschool show, but. But, but so, so that, you know, he has to like, and this, there's this mom and he's like on top of this, this giant building and they have to scale this building and, and to get his tool belt, to get his anti-stick uh, lubricant spray off of his tool belt. 
And when you see a monster in any sort of movie or animation, your first thought is like, well, this is a bad thing. And how are you going to you know, get the bad guy? And how, what are we going to show our kids with this monster killing? And, and the monster ends up just wanting to high five everybody. And that's why they're stuck to him. <laughs> Best intentions, man. Yeah. So what, what were you guys like? Who thought like who in the room was like, I got it. High five and octopus sticky hand monster. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's just it's a super fun process. That's the best part of it is just being in a room and trying to navigate that puzzle of like, okay, we've got lubrication, we've got silicon. What's you know, okay, what uh let's see, what you know, let's wouldn't it be cool if there was some sort of like giant towering inferno kind of epic, you know, scenario uh, monster, monster at the top of a building, King Kong, you know, you're just like riffing and, and writing these things down and, um, you know, okay, well, what if, you know, I think one of the prompts there was sort of like, what, what would Chico do if he didn't have his tool belt, you know? So mm -hmm. that was, that was sort of the impetus to like, oh, well, you know, the, the monster could have the tool belt there and then he's got to sort of find other ways, you know, to, uh, cause you know, a lot of times he just relies on his, this tool belt like batman you know it's like i've got everything here and that's you know it's an easy solve um so yeah it's just uh it, it's all a big puzzle and and sometimes you just rack your brain and it doesn't go anywhere and then somebody will say you know high fives yeah the monster just wants a high five and it solves <laughs> everything you know <laughs> i just i i that was when i was like okay we're gonna watch more of this like just let let it play <laughs> And the, and my son too was like, well, I need I need more of this. I need more high fiving, sticky handed monsters. Um. So to your point about Batman, he is kind of like Batman, right? He's kind of like the Batman. Well, I don't want to say Batman because Batman's like a rich guy that beats up poor people. Yeah. He's kind of yeah. like uh, he's kind of like if Batman really helped everybody, and Gotham wasn't this dark city full of crime for the last like 70 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Cause you know, when we were um, first developing the show, we, um, and I, again, I, uh, I want to clarify, I didn't create this. I, I helped develop it. It's based actually on a, um, on a children's book, which you should check out. They're really cool, weird, quirky, children's books that look nothing like the show at all but they're super super fun um but yeah when we were developing it we actually were considering like oh what if there were villains in town that um perhaps were ruining things you know like uh the clogger you know who would be clogging up drains you know uh the breaker you know like kind of like the joker who just like loves like he's maniacal and he just goes around breaking things. And so we're mm -hmm. thinking like, Oh, and maybe, you know, Chico is sort of, he is a sort of a superhero in his own way, superhero fix it guy. Um, so we, you know, we considered that, but it, I don't know, it, it did sort of take it in a little bit of a dark light, you know, yeah. once you bring in like those villains, it's like, it's kind of a little bit more interesting when humans are just kind of creating their own problems by their own ineptitude, you know? Yeah, because you know why? it. And this is just my opinion, and and uh, now we'll, we'll take it maybe the next the next step uh, further. I feel like it's easy for us to make villains because we see things through the good-bad binary, right? That's how your news is presented to you. If you watch Fox, Democrats are bad. If you watch MSNBC, Republicans are bad. And there's never any context to these individuals. And I was on a show the other night and I was recommending this Reagan documentary. It's a, it's a great documentary on Ronald Reagan. It doesn't launder his reputation at all. Um, it's just, it kind of just explains to you how he goes from being like a New Deal Democrat to <laughs> the man that you know cut taxes for very very wealthy people um and one of the guys was on the show with me was like no nah, man i'm not i'm not gonna watch it because i don't i don't like that guy like he's a, he's a villain he's a bad dude and i was like 
when we see things through kind of the comic book lens of villainy, I, I, I think that means that people are just inherently evil. And why I like Star Wars so much is because George Lucas, you know, to the chagrin of many of his fans, <laughs> gives you an origin story on the origin of, of the ultimate evil. You know, I am also a child of the 70s and 80s um, before Darth Vader became a comic punchline and, and, and over, overly marketed. He was like the scariest thing ever. That was like something you saw in your nightmares. And what is the backstory to that character? And he, you know, in those prequels, you try to humanize the the ultimate evil of the galaxy. And, you know, people just didn't like it. And when you have a show like yours where they're looking for the slasher, and there's an episode where everything is getting slashed in town, like someone's just going around slashing clotheslines and everything. And you find out it's just a porcupine that doesn't understand that his his quills are cutting things. Um. And not to say that every super bad person is just a nice guy hiding, but there's context to, to, to the actions of people. And I like that your show does that, not having just villains. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't, I mean, we're, yeah, that's, that's tricky when, when you just see what you think is evil and just, we're, we're all human. You know, we were all children at some point, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, Darth Vader mm-hmm. was a child, you know, yeah. he, he didn't, you know, he wasn't, uh, maybe he was born evil. I guess you could, could <laughs> say that in some way he was maybe, but I mean, you know, there's, there's reasons for our behavior and to try and to try and understand it and have a little bit of empathy and understanding, you know, um, of, why people are thinking differently, why they're acting differently. Um, you know, we don't get into that in our show, but like, <laughs> I mean, yes, you know, but preschoolers. But. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, we keep, keep things on, on the positive tip <laughs> for sure. It's just, it's just, it's it, it, like I said, it's just refreshing because it's easy to just have a bad guy. Yeah. Um, we live next door to, uh, my two year old's older cousins and they like uh, PJ masks and there's nothing wrong with that show. It's a cute little show. There's like a quote unquote bad guy in that show. Right. And th- there comes a point where people start looking at the world through the same lens as, as cartoons. Um, I had to put on Twitter the other day. I was like, I, I hate to break it to a lot of you guys, but Donald Trump isn't Cobra commander. <laughs> Like, it's not. <laughs> and I know it'd be fun for him to, to, to him to yell out Destro's name with that weird accent, but it's just not. It's not what it is. <laughs> sometimes. Um. Do you do you see that sometimes? Like in the in the in the bigger world, do you do you feel that way sometimes? Like, damn, like you guys need to stop seeing things through this good bad binary. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's why we're so we're so divisive, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's hard not to go there too. Cause I mean, some things just are so clearly awful, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, but, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, it's not a, it's not a pretty time. (laughs) (laughs) And, and here in California, we're, we're about to get another, uh, another lockdown, another severe lockdown with curfew and everything. Yeah. Or we I think it's going on right now, right? There's a curfew. Yeah, right now. yeah, LA just kicked in, yeah. And LA's was really strict, wasn't it? It was, yeah, yeah. People are all up in arms about that. But, uh, I'm I'm all for it. I'm on I'm on the safety <laughs> side. So yeah. but, you know, but I'm fortunate I can, you know, I can s- exist in my little world here making cartoons and mm-hmm. so I'm very fortunate mm-hmm. in that regard. So, uh, are you doing any new shows too? Are they like saying, Hey, Hey, Bob, uh, (laughs) sent you home. (laughs) (laughs) We need some more shows. What else you got? You got a, uh, you got a lion with a jackhammer. What else you got? (laughs) No, no, nothing, nothing going on. Just, yeah. Waiting to hear about a second season of Chico and, um, yeah, it's just, you know, on the, on the other side of things, I just work on my own art. Um, to just yeah you know, keep keep me sane 
um, and not be stuck in front of the computer the whole whole time. I like to make things with my hands. So, um, yeah, it's, that's that's all that's going on. Do you do you still try to play some football when you get a chance? No, I'm all about the running these days. So yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. If, if I tried to like run an out route, I think my <laughs> my knee would go in four different directions. <laughs> I hung on to that though, like into my, I don't know, I guess into my forties, I guess I was playing, you know, flag football, you know, mm-hmm. with, with all these guys who were just hanging on to their glory days, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and pretending they're in the NFL, but playing flag football. And, uh, I don't know. It was just, you know, I, I'm really that glad I didn't, I didn't go the, the NFL route. There's just so much testosterone there mm-hmm. that like, mm-hmm. I couldn't hang with that. You know, I wasn't made for that. I, I found my I found my tribe with runners, you know. They're they're definitely like much more open minded and and like left leaning and, and artistic. I think you know, not that there aren't in in the NFL, but um, yeah, I think as a whole, they're 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 more in line with me with my values. I think is is the animation world a, a left leaning world or is it is it a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B? It's, like, are it's you very, do you, it's very left wing. Yeah. Um, and the entertainment industry as a whole is, um, it's, it's interesting. It's hard. Like I do know some people that are, are right wing Trumpists and it's hard. I mean, like I actually, I kind of feel for them. I mean, not Mm -hmm. for their politics, but to exist, you know, if you were, if you were a left wing person and, and like, and the whole industry was right wing, and you go in every day, and all you're hearing is um, all about Trump is great, and all the, the and you're the only left wing person there. And you, if you raise your voice, you're looked down on. You know, like I can't imagine how difficult that would be. Um, it's hard to have too much empathy for, for those. <laughs> but 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 it is. I mean, it's it. You know, I think because things are so extreme, it's. Um, it is difficult to have empathy in, in that regard, but um, yeah. But it, what would what would the Trump version of of a Chico Bonbon look like? Wow! <laughs> wow! <laughs> He'd just be the 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 ruler of of Blunderberg. Yeah, that'd be it. <laughs> that'd just I don't be know. It. You know, we we definitely avoided that. Like, I mean, we made the, we made the mayor like very blundering, you know, it's just, mm-hmm. and she's just all about like loves to cut the ribbons and loves the ceremony of politics. And is like, has great intentions, but like, you know, um, that completely does the wrong thing that leads to chaos, you know, oh, but, uh, like Garcetti. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah. No, I love how you turn it around. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I, do, I do some I do some shows and I have uh, some friends down in Southern California. Uh, I actually work with with the unhoused population here or worked with the unhoused population here in Oakland at one of the uh, Operation Room Key shelters. And I have fr- uh, friends that also worked in that world in, in L.A. where it seems like it's even more bureaucratic and uh yeah, I don't know if you were following the news. I don't even know if it was really on the news down there. But just recently, there was a bunch of people on Thanksgiving that got evicted from vacant houses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, oh, that, did, did they cover that in the the news down there? Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. yep. So yeah, that was a. I think it was was it the Caltrans thing. Yeah, like, like, yeah. The homes with yeah. yeah. So for people listening, Caltrans bought. Uh, so Cal, Caltrans is like the transit system here in california and they bought a bunch of houses because they were going to clear them out for a freeway extension in the 70s i think so it goes back a while yeah Yeah. (laughs) and the freeway extension never happened yeah so they were sitting on these houses i want to say like 400 houses i've been sitting on them forever and they've been vacant forever and at some point uh, like 22 of them were, were going to get uh, leased to the organization that deals with the unhoused in LA, but there were still a bunch more that had been vacant for years. 
and so some people that needed shelter started staying in these in these uh vacant homes and uh, it was it was pretty it was a pretty disgusting scene to see police in like riot gear because there was a bunch of people that tried to stop it yeah stop the eviction um and it was on thanksgiving too wasn't it like it was bad, on bad thanksgiving optics, right? <laughs> on thanksgiving yeah like ah uh, when you see things like that and you go to create something does it ever influence you at all in your creation when you see things like that or your storytelling i should say um you know I, like i said i think you know we just try and like lean into the positive and put the positive out in mm -hmm. the world you know so mm -hmm. that um you know, it might lead to a story about housing, like how would Chico solve a housing problem? You know, I think we've added gotcha. that around, you know, like, mm -hmm. <clears throat> or other social issues that like, oh, what's the way that Chico would solve a problem in a, <clears throat> in a humane way? You know? Yeah. Um, and hopefully like, you know, we make these shows for the kids, but we, you know, we try and make ourselves laugh, but like, hopefully hopefully the kids are going to take something away. And that generation is that generation that grows up with Chico or wow, wow, Wubsy is going to bring forth some, I don't know, maybe we may touch them in some small way, you know, that like impacted their, their values or their more morality in some way. Um, who knows? I mean, but leading with the good and the positive solution <laughs> um, with Chico, it was like always very, uh, uh, improv based. I was like, yes. And everything, you know, like, so it's mm -hmm. all very positive based like stuff. There was no, anytime we veered into anything negative, we just tried to like steer it into a positive solution. You know, and that's just, that's sort of Chico's MO as well. Uh, I think it's, it's just a good thing to put out there. And side note, I just realized that tiny is female. Yeah. 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 I, I, was in we definitely were you know like um <laughs> we we're trying to make sure that there was representation you know um and that's that's been a big thing across cartoons you know for most recently you know definitely on powerpuff we were trying to like populate you know there's always incidental characters in the backgrounds of these mm -hmm. shows and a lot of times it, in the old days it would just be dudes you know because it because <laughs> yeah. dudes were drawing them you know like, yeah um so we're just really conscious about that i think uh, gina davis actually the the actress she came by cartoon network she's got some sort of foundation which is all about making sure there's female representation in really yeah yeah um and she came and just sort of gave a talk about like the she gave all the numbers on you know like how unrepresented women are in ways that mm -hmm. you just don't realize, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and ethnicities as well, you know, so we just try to be like really, really diverse with that. Um, yeah. I mean, the, I try and personally in the stuff that I create, try and stay away from racial stuff. Like that's why I like with Wubsy, I, you know, like I like doing things that are non-human mm -hmm. um, so that they can apply, have more universal appeal. You know, I think there's definitely a place for uh, representation. There should be more color and, and diversity in the characters that are portrayed in, in entertainment, especially for kids, you know, so that they can see themselves. Right. And, and like Doc McStuffins, you know, an African-American, like uh, that's hugely important. Um, but for me, it, it, I, I'm not yeah. African American, and I don't have that yeah. voice. But I also don't want to make another show about a little white kid. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's enough of those, and like, so to me, I I go towards animals or creatures or you know things that don't have any sort of ethnicity or racial things going on with them at all. So it's just you know they can apply to anyone, like. Black kid, Asian kid, Hispanic kid can look at Wubsy and hopefully see a bit of themselves in in that. Same with Chico, you know, um, those characters just making them animals, and so that the kids can bring whatever they 
have in their lives, they can bring it into that character, you know, and not go, oh, it's, you know, it's a white kid. I'm going to buy the white Barbie doll, that kind of. It, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't remember if this conversation had made uh, the, the episode with Dan Larson and I, but we definitely got into a conversation about uh, Chadwick Boseman and, and Black Panther. And I don't, are you a Marvel guy at all or, or action movie guy? At all? I, I, not heavily now. But 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 Black Panther kind of what blew my mind about that was the fact that I was seeing like young white kids that wanted to be Black Panther for Halloween. Yeah. That year that came out and just like across the board, everybody was like, well, this costume is cool. It's all black. It's got claws. Yeah. And this is what I want to be. And this is the care. And it was the first time I had seen in my 43 years. White kids that wanted to be a black dude. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought that was that was really for me, that was a really powerful thing to see because there's a scene in the show Stranger Things that they don't really touch on race too much in Stranger Things. There's just one remember there's one scene where they dress up like Ghostbusters and they tell the black kid that he's got to be the black guy. <laughs> he's like, I don't want to be the black guy in Ghostbusters because the black guy in Ghostbusters is lame. <laughs> he's not as cool as as the other guys. So I want to be the cool guy too. And that, I thought that was a very interesting conversation that definitely would have happened in that type of suburb in the 80s yeah right yeah so yeah i i yeah i do appreciate you using animals <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean I, th- I think that's that's important i think so yeah well uh mr boyle is there anything else you'd like to to shout out before we go no no i'm 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 just I'm glad, uh, glad we had this chat, man. And any, any time you want to talk cartoons, <laughs> and, and then throw your your uh, political interpretation, <laughs> which I love. I laughed when I read your 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 email. I just thought, wow, that's great. I'm I'm so glad. You know, again, you brought to it what you what's in your life and where your head is. You know, and you mm-hmm. saw it through your lens, which is super cool. Well, the whole family sees it through this lens now, and Comrade Chico is, <laughs> is what we're going to cut. So, if you're if you're bo- if you're at home bored, and I, and and I do suggest books all the time, and I'd suggest documentaries. There is a documentary on. I hate to say it, Amazon, uh, about Gilligan's Island being a socialist show. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. hilariously okay. funny. And they literally take Gilligan's Island's clips and episodes and show you point by point how all of these are Marxist critiques and, and Lenin critiques, Leninist critiques of the US. It's pretty hilarious. Wow. Yeah. But it's hey. it's it's the documentary. Have you, uh speaking of cartoons and politics, have you seen this um, documentary about Pepe the Frog. <gasps> I saw the trailer for it and uh, Zero Books publisher Doug Lane um, and I were talking back and forth about it. And he had watched it. And he was blown away by it. Yeah. So it was really good. I just saw the trailer the other day. I was uh, like listening to a podcast and they mentioned it. And I, I had no idea. I don't know how that escaped my attention, but it looks amazing. I didn't know that that guy, I, I honestly thought that. So for people that don't know, there's a meme of this frog named Pepe. I didn't even know it was a thing. Apparently it was like a little cartoon. Was it an animated show? No, he just did like these little indie comics. Like indie. Yeah. And, and so somehow the right wing got a hold of this, like the far right. Like the reactionary neo Nazi right got a hold of this frog and made it a right wing meme. So, what was it five years ago or so when this guy Richard Spencer gets punched in the face? He's literally talking about Pepe the Frog. He goes, Yeah, Pepe the Frog is kind of our guy. And then when somebody punches him in the face, and that became a meme. And the guy that created this frog. Does wants nothing to do with <laughs> <laughs> he's, the he's right like wing. This guy, I mean, he's a sweet little cartoon maker, you know. And his yeah, they just totally co opted his character, and he had no control totally. over it. 
None. He lost control over this thing that he created that was not supposed to be a meme for the right wing. So yeah, I, I do I do want to check that out. Now you got me wanting to watch that. Yeah. <laughs> so now you got two things to watch. You gotta watch this Gilligan thing because I think you're gonna crack up the whole time. You're gonna be like, oh yep, I did. Yep. <laughs> Cause that's Cold War era. Yeah. Yeah. That show. So there was a lot of scenes like Russians coming on the island. I totally forgot. Oh, about that's that. right. Yeah. Yeah. I could I I grew up like watching reruns of that for sure. So yeah, go go watch that. You'll be like, no way. <laughs> uh, and then we are working on an animated series uh uh here. So Oh yeah? Yeah, I'll, I'm going to talk to you about that off air. Okay, all right. So thank you, uh, Mr. Boyle, for taking the time to talk to me. Please don't hang up. You're going to hear some music. That was a fun interview. I do like to switch it up every now and then on the show. Sometimes uh, the show can get a little heavy. <laughs> the last few episodes for me uh, were some were some real heavy episodes. So when I had the opportunity to uh, to speak with Mr. Boyle, I totally jumped on it. Uh, I'm still shocked that he was willing to do an interview <laughs> with this crazy leftist show uh and and uh and discuss my my son's favorite cartoon and hopefully i know there's parents that listen to this show as well uh maybe it's your kid's favorite cartoon too um and he's done so much stuff like you know literally this man has touched my 22 year old all the way down to my two-year-old um so that's that's some great work thank you guys for listening uh, don't forget every tuesday night we do the live stream so wherever you're listening to this show there is a link in the description to the youtube channel please subscribe to the youtube channel and you can see the live stream and it starts at 6 p.m pacific standard time it's fully interactive uh, I did talk with Mr. Boyle about maybe coming on the live stream. He told me a little bit about his spouse, who also uh, is an animator. Uh, she does. She did like G.I. Joe. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So, anyway, thank you guys very much for taking the time to listen. Please stay tuned uh, for more fun episodes. And I will talk to you soon. Peace.